Hi, Dr. Fauci. Good afternoon, Dr. Fauci. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you guys. Nice to see you as well, sir. It's, it's such an incredible honor uh, to meet you and interview you for the HPHR. I'm Ryan Sutherland. And I'm Javed Iqbal. Um, and since its inception, HPHR has been guided by a vision to provide a platform, training, and support network for the next generation of public health thought leaders committed to social justice, a place to explore and grow our voices and democratize access to public health scholarship. As students of public health, many of us at vastly different stages of our professional careers, we are all united in one goal, an earnest desire to improve public health across the globe. You've become quite a well-known public figure this year and not without detractors. I think it's fair to say that many public health students, myself included, Javed included, look up to you and admire the way you've navigated the country through the pandemic, uh, letting evidence guide you despite frictional moments with those who do not share your views. Your leadership has been an inspiration to all of us at HPHR and to many across the country. Again, it's an absolute honor uh, to have you and welcome. I thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's good to be with you. Look forward to the discussion. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Fauci, given how the Delta variant is causing another surge in cases across the country, uh, what role can public health students play to improve COVID-19 vaccine adoption? You know, I, um, that's a great question, Yaved, and, and I think it's uh, one of them. I'm sure there are many things, but one of the things that stands out in my mind is that in all of the experience that I've had now over four decades from the very, very first early days of HIV was the realization that sometimes there's a little bit disinformation uh, and you can correct it. And then there becomes almost ingrained disinformation. And the one thing that I'm seeing now very painfully is that the disinformation and misinformation, which has the new um, platform of social media, can be thoroughly destructive to what you're trying to do with public health in our country and global health throughout the world. So what I was was hope, and I'm glad that's one of the reasons why I was excited about being with you guys to talk to people like yourselves and people at their different stages, is the best way to counter disinformation is by flooding the system with people who are deeply involved with the truth and who have one goal, which is what people in public health have, to preserve and protect the health and the safety of the people of the world. That, that's what public health is about. And what we need is people like yourselves to be unafraid to speak out, even when you have people who are countering you with complete misinformation. You know, it was much easier early on when there were difficulties in understanding things that we didn't fully understand about HIV. But it was mostly people who really wanted to know what the right answer was, what the truth is. We're dealing now with people in which truth is completely irrelevant, and that is really a problem. So I think the future of people like you all and like me, if whatever future I still have left in my aging years, is going to be to try against obstacles that we never had to face before. I mean, there was always a little bit of a fringe of lack of reality, lack of truth, lack of uh, proper communication. But now it's like they're out there in full bloom. So we need people who are wedded to public health at its highest level of integrity. And that's what the young people now who are studying public health are so important. You cannot imagine how important you are. It's almost like you know, we're at this war. Um, it's now a war of microbes, things that I've predicted for decades. People have always asked me, you know, what my worst nightmare is. I never thought that I would actually wind up living through my worst nightmare, which was an outbreak of a highly transmissible disease, infectious disease that has the capability of killing a lot of people, but that's why we're there. So you guys are the soldiers in the army because it really is a war. It's a war of not only the micro, but a war of disinformation. It, it indeed is. The Surgeon General recently highlighted how misinformation is a crucial public health challenge. 
Uh, how do we address this challenge while communicating the importance of public health measures such as masking? Yeah, well, that, well, <laughs> here we go, because what, what we need to get people to understand, and this is really critical, I'm not so sure, well, I, I guess we say we haven't done a very good job of it, but I'm not so sure that it was through any deliberate fault of our own. But when you're dealing with the evolution, and that's why public health, particularly in the arena of infectious diseases, I'm fully aware that public health goes well beyond infectious diseases, but when you're dealing with an outbreak, there's a certain dynamic nature of it that unfolds in front of you. And you never really know where it's going until it gets there. <laughs> you know, when we were first getting information early on, one had to make recommendations. They looked to public health people. What should we do that's based on the information that we have? Now, if information is static and you change what you say, then you could say you're flip-flopping. But if information rapidly changes and you move with it and make your recommendations and analyze it, that's confusing to the general public who don't spend as much time as you and I and all of your colleagues do, because they think, wait a minute, you told us this one day, now you're telling this another day. That's because, A, you're dealing with the evolution of an un, a, a previously unexperienced outbreak. We've, we've never experienced anything like this in 102 years since 1918. So particularly when you're dealing with a situation where the initial information that was coming out from China was what the Chinese generally do. They, they just hold back information. That doesn't mean anything leaked from a lab or that they created it. They just somehow, it happened with SARS-1. Remember, maybe you weren't around then, but, but with SARS-1, it was kind of like, oh, it's just another influenza because they didn't like the idea that some new disease was coming out of Guangdong province. And only when it got to Hong Kong did we realize that we were dealing with a brand new disease. So there are so many factors in now that are problematic, but we can't shrink from it. I mean, shrink from it. That, that's our destiny. That was what we chose. We chose a field that is very complicated, that has dynamic aspects to it, that is easily prone to misinformation, and a general public who you wouldn't expect to understand all the intricacies of what we do. So to me, that's part highly challenging, but part you know, you know, of what we do. No, nobody said it would be easy. If anybody wants to have do something easy, you're in the wrong field if you're in public health. It's extremely gratifying, extremely gratifying, because when you do something that has impact, you can save literally millions of lives. Um, but you have the responsibility of getting it right and getting a moving target right is tough. Absolutely. Um, and I'm thinking also here, Dr. Fauci, about the intersections of HIV and COVID-19, both of which in the US have disparately impacted racial and ethnic populations and sexual and gender minorities. What lessons have you brought with you from your work in addressing the HIV epidemic to the current COVID-19 pandemic across your storied career? Well, I mean, it's just it proved what we knew early on with 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 HIV is, um, first of all, uh, people who are who don't have access to care um, are the ones that invariably suffer the most. Um, what we learned with HIV is that health disparities are real. I mean, they are real and they have impact. It's eerily um, repeating itself with COVID-19 because right now, if you look at the situation with HIV, you know, 12 to 13% of the population is African-American and 44% of all the new infections are among African-Americans, 65% among gay men who are African-American and 75% of them are young. I mean, that is not, that is due, quite frankly, I say this and, and the far right goes nuts when I say it, but that's racism. 
I mean, it's it's the it's the effect of of racism that people don't even appreciate how subtle it is to put people in positions where they are prone to not only from the, the, the economic and other positions they find themselves in, but in the underlying comorbidities that they have. The whole idea of comorbidities right now with COVID, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, chronic renal disease, chronic uh, liver disease, all of those things are the reasons why you have the kind of disparate suffering among brown and black people with COVID-19. So you just sort of, got, it, it has different forms with different diseases. You know, back with HIV, when it was predominantly um, gay men who were not African-American gay men, who were just, you know, gay men in the community, that they were disenfranchised for obvious reasons. They had only really gained their ability to express their sexual identity after the Stonewall riots in, in uh, 1969 in, in Greenwich Village. But they had been people who were discriminated against all along. So when HIV came along, the response to it really wasn't adequate until the activist community took over and said, hey, you know, we really need a seat at the table. So right now, throughout the world, <laughs> the world who doesn't have access to vaccines say we need a seat at the table about where the vaccines are our responsibility to get vaccines to people. So there are so many lessons learned. It just repeats itself in a little bit of a different form from outbreak to outbreak. And just to sort of wrap up here, Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, in this very unusual year, we've all found inspiration in your unwavering determination. And, you know, in your recent address to the MPH class of 2021 at the Yale School of Public Health, you told graduates the challenges brought by the COVID-19 pandemic at home and abroad have brought into sharp focus the world's needs for science and art of public health professionals. So do you have any further advice uh, for students who are looking to pursue public health as a career? You, you gave some earlier, but... Yeah, you know, it's go with your passion. Um, uh, not, not everyone should be going into public health. That would be impossible. Um, it isn't that you downplay other decisions in life of what people have, but if you have even the slightest propensity and inclination that this is what you want to do, I can guarantee you that as tough as things might be along the line, it is an amazing profession. It just, it is. I mean, the, the gratification that I've gotten there, the energy that I've gotten over the years to pursue it, to know that even though you might be working underneath the radar screen and nobody knows what you're doing, um, you're having an impact. You really are. I mean, everybody looks at me now because I'm very much of a public figure for better or worse, you know, half the people <laughs> hate me and half the people love me. It's not, it's a strange situation. I would have never have predicted that when I was going through what I was doing in the early years of HIV, when we were struggling to get this thing on the map, to get the right response to it. You know, you did it and you did it, you know, sometimes in a very lonely way. That's okay. Don't worry about that. You don't need to be visibly known by everybody. It's the gratification that you get out of that. You know, I, I would trade, believe me, uh, having the kind of gratification that I have without any of the recognition and all the hoopla any day of the year. What really counts is what you've accomplished. And that's what all of you who are in this field should focus on because you're all going to be doing in your own way, something that's very, very important for your for fellow man. I mean, and that's what it's all about. You know, what do we do for others? Do we leave the world a better place when we leave? That's what counts. And that's what, in my mind, public health ranks way up there in that. Not the only group that does that, but it ranks way up there. Indeed. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. On behalf of all of us at HPHR and the students of public health across the nation, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much, guys. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.